So we, we normally uh, sing uh, an invitational song to, to call the spirits in. And uh, we're doing this because uh, we want this to be a ceremonial experience and we want the spirits here as, as part of this, as a ceremony. Han blag loka is what they would call a, a, something like a speech. Type of, so. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to the third installment of Psychedelic Shine. Um, this is about indigenous traditions and peyote um, medicine work. Uh, before I forget, just to put that music into context as a prayer and imagine being in a sweat lodge ceremony, it's a very soul awakening experience um, and, uh, uh, and very amazing. So we really encourage you to participate in, in this community. Uh, my name is Daniel McQueen, and I'm the executive director of Medicinal Mindfulness. And Medicinal Mindfulness is a, a grassroots consciousness community uh, that puts on these events, and uh, not just to promote and support the legalization and safe use of sacred psychedelic medicines, but also to uh, promote and celebrate and support communities that are already living examples of safe and sacred uh, medicine traditions. Um, I want to give a brief outline today. We're going to, uh, Chris Long is going to speak about uh, indigenous concepts of light and dark. Um, and then we'll have an extended Q&A for uh, those who are uh, wanting to ask questions. I would really encourage you to think about some good questions you'd like to ask about his work, um, uh, peyote ceremonies or, or his presentation. Then this is also a community gathering, so we're going to have an extended break of about 30 minutes, so um, plenty of time to get a drink and support Shine, our host, and uh, get to know each other. Uh, and then after that, there'll be a couple of uh, short slideshows about their community, and then they're going to um, do some more uh, Lakota ceremonial songs and peyote songs. So I really encourage you to stay for, for the whole event. Uh, I apologize for the late start. It seems like there was some parking issues for a lot of folks. Um, so, uh, so we can go a little bit later than, than ending right at 5. Um, so we met the Singing Stone community through uh, an intern of mine named Alejandro Cordova, a uh, uh, wonderful person, and he asked us if, um, and he was a member of Chris's community, and he asked us if we could somehow create um, 
the, the, the Native American church circles as part of his internship project process. And, and I thought it was Naropa. I thought, why not, right? Let's give it a try. And so we created these um, community events where we, we took, um, he, he uh, supported bringing three communities to uh, Chris and Andrea for Native American church circles. And we've done, we've uh, visited them five times as our community this, so far. Uh, we're having another uh, um, trip down to Crestone in May and also in September. So if you're interested in that, we have more information. Um, so all I can say is it's a big experience. And as a medicine practitioner myself, it was one of the top five. It was a, a sacred experience, very deeply moving and healing. And it's been about 10 months since my first experience uh, ceremony with with this community, I'm still unpacking it. It's, uh, it was a life-changing event. So I encourage you, if you are thinking about coming down with us, to consider that, uh, that um, there's a real potential here for it to be life-transforming. Um, this is why we work with this community. It's, uh, they're so sincere and honoring of their tradition. And uh, it's such a privilege to, um, to go visit them in, in, in their spiritual home. So. Uh, so I have uh, the honor to introduce Christopher Long. Uh, he's the Native American Church Roadman, a co-founder and president, a spiritual leader of the Singing Stone community. Um, he's a Yuwipi man, and is, from what my understanding is, there's only about 40 of these in the world. Uh, it's, a, it's a major initiation. I'm looking forward to participating in, um, in a Yuwipi ceremony soon. Uh, and he is a medicine man. Um, I would encourage you to think about the uh, integrity and the uh, honoring of the traditions that he represents. And, and uh, he's very open and sincere about sharing these traditions. So this is a really neat opportunity to um, learn something that you're really wanting to learn, that you're really longing to learn. So, so please take advantage of this opportunity. And we also encourage you to support this community. Again, they're a living example of a, a tradition that has never ceased for thousands of years. Um, and so uh, visiting them, going to work uh, days, uh, contributing financially, is, this, is, this is a community that I, I fully support. Um, so I'm very grateful for uh, Chris uh, and his family and friends coming up and sharing what they have to offer here. Um, I would describe Chris as um, deeply sincere in, in his practice, highly skilled, I've known a lot of people in my line of work and uh, met a lot of people, and um, I'm very grateful for the, uh, the, the space that he held in, in the circle that, that he invited us to. And, um, and one of the things I love about these ceremonies is that Chris is a bit wild, and there is a rewilding that, that happened to many in our community. It's not, it's not a... Uh, it's not an MDMA-assisted psychotherapy session, you know, for for he, you know for trauma healing purposes. This is a um, a religious event. Um, so please uh, uh, welcome Christopher Long um, for this presentation. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Well, it's good to see the turnout here tonight. So um, first, I'd like to just talk a little bit about uh, the Native American church. And uh, that was, uh, it was probably back in the 1890s that it was uh, incorporated as a, a, uh, a church. Um, so it's a federally recognized church and, and the only federally protected church in the United States. And... Uh, so we have this, uh, what's known as a special status uh, because of the use of, of POD. And so, um, of course, in the 1890s when the Native American church became uh, incorporated as a church, uh, there were no drug laws. So, uh, so it's remained that way. So uh, as a roadman, I'm registered with the DEA and the Department of Narcotics to be able to... Uh, to um, uh, preserve this tradition and uh, give people the uh, sacred sacrament of the herb peyote. And uh, we get our, our medicine from uh, Texas, and, uh, and it all happens in a, in a legal way. Of course, um, 
we'd be a lot happier if, if the laws were even freer, of course. But um, just wanted to talk a little bit about that and um, uh, open your minds to uh, the possibility of coming to a ceremony and, and being a part of a ceremony like that. I know on the reservations we're used to uh, uh, having ceremonies with a lot of children and, and elderly and things like that. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a little different in, in uh, some of the situations when we have a, a bunch of really young kids and, and younger people come to the ceremony and, and, it, and uh, it would be really nice to, to show it how it is for a lot of the different Native American churches across this country where it's a really um, um, kind of different with um, a, a mix of, of family that way. But um, all of you are, are welcome to attend our ceremonies and just check our, our website. We have our calendar there and, uh, and we welcome uh, everybody to come to those ceremonies. Uh, as a service to humanity. And uh, so, yeah, I wanted to uh, talk today about um, the concepts of, of light and dark. I know in a lot of uh, contemporary traditions, uh, contemporary religions, they have uh, different concepts of, of light and dark. And uh, so it, it seems like a lot of times it's uh, quite fear-based, you know, because you have to understand uh, uh, when I say contemporary traditions, I'm talking about traditions that are uh, eight to 2,000 years old. You know, 2,000 years, that's like a, uh, 200 or 20 lifetimes, really. It's really not that long. And so that's a very new traditions. And um, they've kind of imposed this concept of, of good and evil. And in the Native tradition, you know, We've always had a, 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 the balance of, of that in our symbology. Uh, in the Sundance, for instance, we use a, a forked cottonwood tree. It's a tree with a fork on it. And so we have these two polarities. And uh, you know, the whole universe is made of, of polarities. We see the uh, positive and negative ions, you know, that, that create, uh, matter as we know it. Everything is made out of these two forces. And the whole universe is upheld by those two forces. So it's, it's a very um, important that they stay in balance. You know, we see things like male and female, uh, light and dark, the sun and the moon. And, and, and we're raised, really, with, with seeing the, in nature, the, the balance and, and the dichotomy of these two forces. Uh, but it gets a little strange when, um, when you get into a religion or a spiritual practice that starts saying that one of these is good and the other is not, and, and, and that you should be in pure light and, and exclude the dark. I mean... That, that really puts you out of balance there, especially with the concept of a male and female. You have a mother and a father, and, and all of a sudden the, 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 the shadow of the night is cast over your mom. <laughs> you know, it, does, it just doesn't make sense. And, uh, you know, one of the, the greatest things about Native philosophy is, is how we see the light and the dark and uh, we wouldn't refer to it to good and evil. I mean, there's certainly things that are, that are bad. And, um, and that's a very important thing, is to know what's good and what's bad. And that's you know, one of the, the contrasts that we're, in our lives we're so needing to be aware of what is good and what is bad, of course. And that's a part of the duality of life. Uh, so, so in terms of spirits, you know, some people, some traditions would say there's this group of organized bad spirits, and then there's this group of organized good spirits, and it's really quite not like that. 
I mean, you can see a group, uh, a hive of bees is, is organized. But if you really look at them, they're all just really doing their thing. It just all seems to work out. And uh, so that, a good example is to, to really look at nature and look at the animals and say, well, you know, <laughs> are mountain lions evil? You know, we're afraid of them and they could do us harm. But are they inherently evil? No, of course not. I mean, to a mouse, my house cat is evil. You know, it's like that, that house cat is not a good thing for the mice. And uh, they all run away when, when the cat shows up. And it's like that with spirits, too. You know, there are some that are uh, negative towards us that are that leave perfectly normal lives. You know what we what we usually do in 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 uh, in any indigenous traditions really, uh, we, we leave out water or offerings for the spirits, and that's something that contemporary religions have uh, uh, stopped doing, and it's a really important thing because uh, in 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 the spiritual life it's important to to make friends. I mean it's really no no different than than getting ahead at work or even climbing a corporate ladder. What you want to do is you want to make friends. You want to be a nice person and, and be able to make friends. So when we put water out for the spirits, I know uh, personally I don't uh, bar any spirits from having some water. And that's, you know, a lot of times I'll do this outside because some of the spirits I don't want in my house, you know, and that, that makes sense. But when I'm putting out water, I'm not going to judge and say, well, yeah, I just want these certain kind of spirits to drink this water, you know, because the spirits are, are pretty much like people or animals. They're all different, you know. Some house cats are nicer than others. And, uh, and that's just the fact of how things are. So if I'm going to leave water out for the spirits, I'm going to just go ahead and leave it for the thirsty spirits. And... Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that I welcome them all into my home or that I want to like have a, a relationship with all of them either. I'm just doing the kindly act of, of leaving an offering. And, if, and just like people, you know, if a spirit wants to change, it can actually um, turn over a new leaf and, and become a, a good spirit. And who's to say um, which spirit is going to do that or not? I can't really be judgmental in that way, and but um, but yeah, there are ways that we can um, uh, have boundaries against certain spirits and things. But uh, let me just get into talking too about our relationship with spirits and the the concept of of dark and light in our lives, especially in in a Native American context. So. It's been really interesting for me on this journey of discovery because I've I've learned the the indigenous ways of 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 prayer and ceremony, and uh, in that I've always seen this uh, this uh, duality as as a as a focus point, a, a, a thing to meditate upon, um, and it's been very interesting. Uh, learning about Eastern traditions and seeing how how those things are are seen in the Eastern traditions. Now, I would still consider a lot of Eastern traditions to be what I would call domesticated, where it's been uh, changed and altered or fixed in such a way that it's like easy to do, or that or that there's um, most importantly that there's a way to keep your followers. And uh, and that's a, a, a common mistake with a lot of spiritual leaders is to is to uh, have devices to keep your followers like keep them in fear or or keep them dependent upon you. I mean, we all have this direct connection to the to the great mystery. Each one of us is a birthright, or directly connected to the center of every all that is. And uh, so it seems absurd that you would need some kind of uh, middleman to pray for you, you know, when you have that connection within you, regardless of anything else. Even in sentient things have that connection. But, um, but what I thought was interesting was uh, 
uh, looking at Western psychology and kind of learning a little bit about that and seeing, oh, the, all those elements are still there, you know. Um, and so I'd like to kind of uh, use this box here as a, as a prop. So I, I'm not sure where, where I s saw somebody use this box. I think it was a YouTube video. But uh, someone was explaining the, the subconscious mind. And so, so if we said that this box was your consciousness, your, that your mind, everything in your conscious mind is in this box, and let's say it's full of a lot of different things. So your, your consciousness is, is kind of like a flashlight. Like you can actually look around in this box. So I could say, oh yeah, I'm, I want to think about eating. Think about cooking and eating and shine it into this corner here that has to do with all of that, you know. And uh, let's say you were, uh, uh, say, you had some other kind of a problem. Let's say you had an alcohol or a drug addiction and you had this, in this corner here, you can think about, oh my gosh, my addiction over here, you know. And then there's all these other things in the box, everything you, you remember and that you're consciously aware of in your life. So, so you can actually go over to this other corner here about religion. Let's say you're, you're part of a contemporary religion and you can be in this side of the box and think of the dogma and all your beliefs and all of that and it's all, it's all okay because your, your awareness is in this one part here. And you're not thinking about your addiction over here or your hunger or cooking or anything like that. You're thinking about your spirituality. And so, so a lot of ways that things can get dualistic like that, like separated, like what they call compartmentalized, like where your spiritual beliefs are over here and if your mind's on that, everything's okay and you don't have to think about your addiction over here. You know, but those two exist in the same box. And, um, and in the native traditions, um, it's important to, to know that this is who you are, everything in this box. And uh, it's not, you're, not, you're only going to make things worse if you condemn a part of yourself. And so a, another good example of this would be, would be to look at this, the subconscious mind. Now... In, in, a, in native traditions and in a lot of indigenous traditions, we see the subconscious mind as everything outside of this box. Now there's like your subconscious mind that's, that's closest to your body and to your mind that's around this box. But this container of this box is like the reptilian brain. And, um, and then there's the subconscious mind that watches over you or that sees things that you're doing and, and that is aware when you're unconscious. And it's a, it's a scientific fact. This is kind of a scientific explanation here of this box. Um, but in a lot of traditions, they would say the box is bad uh, because this box is the ego, you know? And so this is also, it's to contain the mind and it's also... To, um, to help with pain. So it's just like if there's an electrical charge of pain going into the mind, the box absorbs it. And uh, so, so let's say some, some uh, little girl was, so let's say a four-year-old girl is in her, in, her, in her bed at night and then the room gets all smoky. She starts choking. She can't breathe. The, the, the smoke alarms go off. And then her parents run in screaming and grab her. She's totally traumatized. And they take her out and, and save her, give her oxygen. Well, let's say like 30, 40 years later, she's, she's at this yoga group and she's doing yoga and they burn some sage, and she smells the smoke, and it, and it makes the fire alarms go off, and it's like the same sound, and it like triggers this part of her, this, the, the, basically this wall between her conscious and her subconscious 
all of a sudden freaks out. She goes into a panic. And it's just little Sage and the fire alarm and everybody else is cool, but she freaks out because it's totally triggered this memory in her. And that memory is stored in this part of her mind. And that's what that part of the mind is for. It's a defense mechanism. So she all of a sudden gets panicked. Like she totally goes into a panic and, and might even go into like an asthma attack or something like that where she can't breathe because she remembers this childhood memory that she may not even be conscious of, may not even uh, be in the conscious mind. It's part of, part of you that is a, a, a defense mechanism. <clears throat> well, looking at psychology, I, I realize this is the, like the reptilian brain, <clears throat> or it's a part of our mind that, that absorbs that uh, pain and also reacts on it later. You could see how an animal could have some kind of an experience and then it could react later on. Not even having to think you could react to save you in a situation. Well, it's this part of the mind that um, a lot of people have labeled as bad. And in, the, in, the, in Eastern traditions like uh, Hinduism, uh, in Buddhism, they would say that this is your kundalini. This is your your power, basically. And in the native tradition, we see this as uh, our, our twin. When we're born, we have this shadow twin that slowly grows apart from us until until we learn to speak. And then that part of us becomes an internalized part. And uh, if any of you have studied about um, Medicine Man or, or any, anything like that, there's this process that happens where that part of yourself becomes freed from your body and is able to act independently. And I'm just explaining some of these processes so that we can get a better idea of, of this idea of light and dark. Um, <clears throat> so, so in a lot of... Uh, contemporary traditions now they say that you need to like condemn this part of yourself and basically cut yourself off from part of this this part of yourself what i want to explain is how this is so dangerous because basically this the the outs, this box the part of this that of your mind that is to absorb pain is basically the wall between uh, your conscious mind and your subconscious out here. And, and to go further to explain really what is the subconscious mind, that's just the part of your mind that isn't always conscious. But it also connects to other things. We're so many layers of, of different beings and, and things. I mean, it's really incredible. And you, you can see that in with people with mental illness. There's just so much going on. If there's just even something a little out of whack, there's no telling what kind of things are going to come through because we're really uh, multi-dimensional beings. We have multi-personalities and all of that. Uh, no telling really what a human being really is. We're so many things, it's, it's unbelievable. And it's such a precarious balance. So, so the subconscious mind, basically, it connects to a collective mind. Now, some of you may have heard that whole uh, idea that uh, uh, when people uh, make an, if somebody makes an invention and they go to the patent office and they patent this invention, well, Oddly enough, there's people from all over the world that just had that idea too, you know. So there's this idea that we have a collective consciousness and, and that other beings have collective consciousness as well. I know I, I w uh, became aware that trees had a collective consciousness and it was really amazing to me to, to, to um, have that concept enter my mind that trees actually can think on this collective level. Um, uh, just as an example, though, and but looking at at 
how we human beings are. It's really interesting because I'll, I'll have thoughts and ideas and I'll think, wow, is that, is that because this whole group of people is, uh, is angry about this issue, you know, that this is actually coming into my mind? Uh, and so, so I'm just really trying to get this concept that there's a collective consciousness. Now, in, in, in Lakota tradition, we say, aho mitako yasin. And that means we're we're all relatives, all of us relatives, and uh, and you can see that how we're all related genetically. Sure, we all have this connection genetically, and that that's a, a scientific fact. You, we have one common mother, they say, whereas uh, a group of chimpanzees might have a thousand common mothers. So as human beings, we're very closely related. But that's not really what that's all about. We would think that with our, our limited mind, that we would assume that that was talking about uh, being physically related. But um, we're, we're related through our, our subconscious and because that subconscious connects to everything, to all that there is, to this very center of the universe, to the creation itself, the creator. So we, um, I know there's that idea of, being, of our body and our mind and our spirit. And you've probably all heard that in many different traditions. They talk about that, the, the body, the mind, the spirit. And you could say that the, the body was in this physical plane and the mind was on a, on a mental plane and the spirit well, a lot of people don't really know too much about the spirit. But, um, but starting with the body, you can see what, what we are as human beings. The mind is, uh, is a thing that, uh, that we use to think. And, and there's many different beliefs about the mind. But we believe that the mind uh, uh, is also everything. So the body is even part of the mind. Um, except for the spirit. The spirit, that's a different thing. And that's a, how we're related. Is we, we all have a spirit. And now we would say there's the concept of the soul. I would say that the soul was part of the mind or a container for the mind. Part of the mind is the soul. So you definitely retain part of the, your mind after passing. And, and of course, some of it might be bodily too. But looking at, at uh, the spirit, then, we see this one substance that has no color, no definition, will never be uh, discovered through uh, scientific means. It, it eludes, uh, eludes us completely. You could even say that everything has a spirit, even if it doesn't have a soul. Everything has a spirit. Everything has a direct line to the creator. <clears throat> and so that's how we're, we're related. But getting back onto this uh, idea of, of light and dark, now, how could you walk uh, out of balance? Like, like in a lot of uh, traditions, you would say, well, I'm now in the light, and, and, and I deny the darkness and, and all of that. That's not even part of myself. It's almost like... A, like a, uh, taking on a, a new personality for yourself. In, and whereas it's interesting talking to, to native elders and talking to them about uh, what they've done on their path to, to get to know what they know about uh, life, about God, about the universe. And, and, if you talk to them, you'll, you'll see that every one of them will talk about the darkness that they went through in order to experience uh, the good, you really have to have had bad in your life. I mean, to have, uh, to be, have immunity from, from pathogens, you need to be exposed to pathogens. You can't, you can't develop a strong immune system in a sterile environment. And, 
And it's the same with, with spiritual, spirituality. You have to have a, a balance of these things. And so I'm not saying, oh, well, what you need to do is, is to go ahead and indulge in these bad things that you do, you know. <laughs> the, the idea is to, is to really look at, look at yourself and see, you know, if you, if you were, let's say, on, on some drugs and, and you lost your mind and you went and you robbed a bank in order to fulfill your addiction, I mean, you can actually look at that and say, oh, yeah, I did all of that stuff, and I see how and, and I see how I was led into that, you know. So you can understand that. I mean, any lab, laboratory animal would fall for the same thing and do and take the same course. You have to understand that and and really take a look at yourself and see how you did something wrong and and how that happened. So I'm not a very judgmental person because I can clearly see, you know, if somebody's down on their luck and they robbed somebody, well, I can understand how they got into that frame of mind. And that kind of thing occurs in nature, too. Every once in a while, there'll be some animal that's basically turned renegade and, and is, is not doing good stuff. And, and that happens every once in a while. Sometimes that happens in nature. Yeah. But, but for... Um, in a to really follow the spiritual path it's essential to to be in harmony with your shadow self and so that doesn't mean that one night you're going to be a good person and the next night you're going to be a bad person you definitely want the bad not to be in control but you also want to to be able to find that part of yourself, your shadow self, and to make friends with it, to have a rapport, and have an understanding, actually understand why it is the way it is. Just like the, the lady, the example I used of the lady that was in the yoga studio and the alarm went off and there was smoke and she, and it was because when she was four, she had this experience of uh, her house burning down and the uh, smoke alarm. And so, so this was um, a, a good example of how to uh, how this part of yourself can be uh, erroneous or, or wrong or negative. So it's very important for for us to to make friends with our shadow self, and and to also um, even allow it to do what it it feels like it needs to do in situations. Like if, if, if it feels like it needs to do something uh, specific, then, then you can actually give it a way to like get that release in a safe way. And so, so we should uh, have a good communication with our subconscious mind. And that is how we're going to communicate to the spirits. If you're going to have any kind of communication with the spirits, you need to be able to go through your subconscious mind. You can't do that if you're against your shadow self. It's the wall between your conscious and the subconscious. It's this gray area between the conscious and the subconscious. So, so, so I just wanted to, to impart that because it's a really important difference between really all indigenous traditions and, and contemporary traditions. And I think it's very important to, uh, to be able to walk in harmony and balance in our spiritual lives.